there's a pattern that appears everywhere. In the spiral of a nautilus shell, in the arrangement of sunflower seeds, in the branching of trees and the formation of galaxies. It's called the Fibonacci sequence, and for centuries, mathematicians and philosophers have wondered why this particular mathematical relationship shows up so persistently in nature. The sequence is simple. Start with zero and one. Then each new number is the sum of the two before it. Zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21. Continue forever. And you get a pattern that somehow describes the architecture of life itself. But here's what makes it stranger. This isn't just about biology or physics. Some have suggested this pattern appears in ancient texts as well, including the Quran. Today, we're going to explore what happens when mathematical structure meets sacred text. Not to prove anything, but to ask a question. What does it mean when the same patterns that govern spiraling galaxies also seem to organize human words? The Fibonacci sequence was introduced to the Western world by Leonardo of Pisa in the 13th century, though the pattern had been studied in India centuries earlier. What makes it remarkable isn't just the sequence itself, but what happens when you divide each number by the one before it. As you move further along, that ratio approaches 1.618, a number we call phi, or the golden ratio. This ratio appears in unexpected places. The proportions of the human body approximate it. The spiral of a hurricane follows it. DNA molecules measure 34 angstroms by 21 angstroms for each full cycle of the double helix, both Fibonacci numbers. Artists from Da Vinci to Salvador Dali used it deliberately in their compositions, claiming it possessed inherent aesthetic harmony. Scientists have proposed explanations. Perhaps natural selection favors these proportions because they optimize space, light exposure, or structural stability. Perhaps it's simply a mathematical inevitability when growth follows certain recursive rules. But no unified theory fully explains why this one ratio dominates so many different systems. The pattern is consistent, yes, but we don't fully understand why consistency takes this particular form. Which brings us to an unusual observation. In 1973, an Egyptian biochemist named Rashad Khalifa began analyzing the Quran mathematically, focusing on the number 19, which appears in chapter 74. His work was controversial and ultimately rejected by mainstream Islamic scholarship, but it opened a door. Others began looking for numerical patterns in the text itself. The Quran consists of 114 chapters, called surahs. Each surah contains a specific number of verses, called ayat. When researchers began examining these verse counts, something caught their attention. The Fibonacci sequence seemed to emerge. Here's what they noticed. The sequence of Fibonacci numbers, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, appears consecutively in the Quran, as chapter numbers with specific structural properties. Surah 1 has seven verses. Surah 2, the longest chapter, has 286 verses. Surah 3 has 200. Surah 5 has 120. Surah 8 has 75. But it goes deeper. Some researchers claim that when you apply Fibonacci-based analysis to the frequency of certain key words in the Quran, particularly those related to creation, the pattern persists. The word day appears 365 times. Days appears 30 times. Month appears 12 times. These aren't Fibonacci numbers themselves, but they suggest a text conscious of numerical structure. The question is whether this is deliberate design, coincidence, or pattern-seeking behavior on the part of modern readers. The Quran itself doesn't present mathematics as a subject of revelation but it does speak about order, balance, and precision in creation. One verse often referenced in these discussions is from Surah Al-Khamar, chapter 54, verse 49, which states, Indeed, all things we created with predestination. In Arabic, the word used is bikadar, which carries meanings of measure, proportion, and precise determination. It's a statement about the nature of existence, not a mathematical formula 
but it suggests a worldview where nothing is random, where structure and order are fundamental properties of reality. Another verse from Surah Ar-Rahman, chapter 55, verse 7, says, In the heaven he raised and imposed the balance. The word mazan here means balance, measure, or scale. It's repeated throughout the Quran as both a literal tool for commerce and a metaphor for cosmic justice and proportion. The idea is that balance isn't just a human concept we impose on the universe. It's woven into the fabric of what exists. The Quran is not a science textbook. It doesn't explain photosynthesis or quantum mechanics, but it does repeatedly assert that creation operates according to fixed laws, that there is order beneath apparent chaos, and that this order reflects something about its source. So here's the tension. Science looks at the Fibonacci sequence and sees emergent complexity, recursive rules producing organized patterns without needing a conscious designer. It's elegant because it's simple. The Quranic worldview sees the same pattern and interprets it as signature, not randomness that looks organized, but organization that was always intended. The difference isn't in the observation, it's in the interpretation of what observation means. Both perspectives agree on the existence of the pattern. They diverge on whether that pattern points inward toward mathematical inevitability or outward toward intentionality. This isn't a question science can answer. Science describes how systems behave. It doesn't address whether that behavior has meaning beyond itself. And sacred texts, including the Quran, aren't offering competing hypotheses about natural law. They're offering a framework for why natural law exists at all. What's fascinating is how this relates to knowledge itself. For centuries, theologians and philosophers have distinguished between what can be known through observation and what must be inferred or revealed. The Greeks called it the difference between episteme and gnosis. Islamic philosophy speaks of the seen and the unseen, the shahada and the ghib. The Fibonacci sequence lives in both worlds. It's observable, measurable, repeatable. But the question of why it appears so universally, why this ratio and not another, remains in the territory of the unseen. We see the effect, but not the full cause. If numerical patterns do appear in the Quran, and this remains a debated claim, it raises an interesting possibility. Not that the Quran is predicting science, but that whoever composed it understood something about structure and order that we're only now beginning to quantify. Or perhaps we're simply good at finding patterns, at seeing faces in clouds and meaning in coincidence. Human brains are wired for this. It's how we survived. There's no definitive answer here, and that might be the point. The universe doesn't owe us explanations. The more we learn, the more questions emerge. Dark matter, dark energy, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, all reminders that our models are incomplete. The Quran, like other sacred texts, claims to offer a different kind of knowledge. Not the mechanics of how things work, but the question of why there are things at all. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why does that something follow comprehensible rules? The Fibonacci sequence might be a clue, or it might be a distraction, but it invites us to think about the relationship between order and origin, between pattern and purpose. Next time you see a pine cone or a seashell, notice the spiral. Count the petals on a flower. Look at the branching of a river delta from above. The pattern is there, silent and persistent. Whether it's the signature of a creator or the signature of mathematics itself, perhaps that's not a question we'll resolve, but it's worth sitting with. Worth considering what it would mean if the same structures that shape galaxies also shape the words humans have held sacred for over a millennium. The Fibonacci sequence doesn't prove anything but it does ask us to look more carefully at the order beneath what we see and to wonder whether that order is accidental or intended. Maybe the question itself is the point.